Nelson Mandela once said that education is the most powerful weapon with which you can use to change the world. But I probably didn't have to quote a famous figure for you to know the importance of education. Our most formative years, the years in which our brains develop the most are spent in schools, should come as no surprise that education is the most impactful body on one's life. And if one were to look up how America is doing in education today, they would likely see that we're around the middle of the pack of the world, placing around 30th on the PISA test, which is generally considered to be the most holistic measure on worldwide education standards. However, this statistic is deeply misleading. A deeper dive reveals that American schools in areas in which poverty is less than 10% have scores which rank first in the world in that test. Meanwhile, schools in which poverty is greater than 75%, or our bottom fifth of schools, have scores on par with those of the developing countries. Do the centuries of systemic racism, which closely linked housing segregation and a biased criminal justice system to education, students in those schools with less than 10% poverty are almost fully white, while school, students in those bottom fifth of schools are almost fully black, or students of color. Startlingly, our schools today are more segregated than they were when Martin Luther King Jr. died some four decades ago. In the course of this talk, I'll explain how this resegregation of schools has occurred, the immensely beneficial impact integrated schooling can have on students, and ways in which we can reintegrate our schools. The landmark 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision took nearly two decades to change schooling in the South and a little to change schooling in the North. In the decade following the decision, only 1% of black students in the South attended an integrated school. Meanwhile, because laws after the decision solely sought to break up laws which specifically segregated schools, they did little to address the more de jour type of school segregation in the North, which was more so rooted in redline housing segregation. Therefore, little efforts to integrate were taken in the North which remains the most integrated area of schooling in the country to this day. Nonetheless, more Supreme and Circuit Court decisions in the 70s mandated busing in the South to integrate schools, and so dramatic strides were made. So, let's look at the impact of some of these dramatic strides due to mandated busing to integrate schools. There's a growing body of research in this field, with perhaps the most comprehensive study being that of Berkeley professor Rucker Johnson in 2015. The study found that average per pupil spending on black students who went to an integrated school went up 22.5%. That each year a black student spent in an integrated school, the likelihood that they would graduate went up 1.8%. And that black students who went to integrated schools were 22% less likely to be incarcerated in life. Further, the education gap in this country between blacks and whites is roughly equivalent to a year. The study found that for each year a black student spent in an integrated school, they gained an additional 0.1 years of schooling, meaning that if a black student spent, say, 12 years in an integrated school, they would more than make up the education gap. On a whole, the study found that, quote, the average effects of a five-year exposure to court-ordered school desegregation led to an 11 percentage point decline in the average annual instance of poverty in adulthood and a 25% increase in annual family income. And this study, as well as others, found that integrated schooling had no negative impact on white students, yet rather a neutral to positive one. To better understand how integration occurs and the ways in which it has been gutted in the past 20 years, it's worth looking at a few examples. Charlotte, specifically West Charlotte High School, was once seen as a model example for integration in the country. This was due to a 1971 court decision, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, which mandated busing to use race-based busing to integrate students across district lines. Soon, West Charlotte High School was 40% black and 60% white. Meanwhile, in the 1988 through 89 school year, just one and 3% of Latino and black students respectively in Charlotte attended 90 plus percent minority schools. Flash forward to the day, however, due to a 1997 lawsuit which overturned that 71 ruling and white flight, those numbers look quite different. In fact, today West Charlotte High School is 88% black and just 1% white. Meanwhile, 44 and 47% of 
of Latino and black students respectively attend those 90 plus percent minority schools. In 2013, the New York Times reported that two thirds of school districts originally under court order to integrate were no longer required to do so and are no longer doing so. The number of apartheid schools, schools in which the white student population is less than 1%, rose from 2,762 in 1988 to 6,727 in 2011, a startling number. Baton Rouge, like Charlotte, had a similarly successful integration program based in busing before it was ended by a 1991 court decision. This was further compounded by a white middle class movement which sought to create a new district out of the city, which would just so happen to be 70% white, according to a PBS Frontline documentary. Further, this new district would just so happen to have most of the AP and honor schools from the original district. It's efforts like these that have greatly dismantled the very nice strides the country made in school integration in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. So, with courts making it quite onerous or even impossible for school districts to use race, as a basis for busing to integrate, districts which risked to remain integrated had to get creative. The most popular choice has been voluntary programs in which minority students can enroll to be bused to more white, better resourced areas. This program is perhaps most well known in Boston, yet NPR reports that only 3,300 students enroll in it each year. Perhaps unsurprisingly though, given what we have discussed, 90% of the students in that program go on to graduate high school on time with higher state achievement test scores than their peers at other Boston area public high schools. Nearby this talk in San Jose, the Tinsley transfer program allows for students from Ravenswood City School District to transfer to the nearby better resource Redwood City or Palo Alto districts. However, the program only accepts 166 students each year. The problem with these voluntary transfer programs, aside from the main one that most school districts originally under court order to integrate don't even offer them, is that they put the onus on minority students to travel the extra distance in order to integrate. So, we know that integrating schools can dramatically change the lives for minority students. We also knew that due to court decisions in the 90s and early 2000s, many districts were unable to do those, pro to do those programs to integrate. So what can we do? One proposal is to put well-resourced magnet schools in minority areas as a draw for a diverse set of applicants. Another is to put affordable housing in high-income areas. Yet while both of these proposals are nice and may work in a sample, they don't address the real root of the problem, districting. Um, but as the Century Foundation discovered, between 60 and 70 percent of school segregation can be attributed to how students are sorted across district boundary lines. Therefore, the Foundation proposes that in order for us to undo centuries of systemic racism, decades of schooling and housing segregation, we must redistrict and interdistrict our cities. An example of this can be found in Louisville, a final city worth examining in this talk. In 1975, on the precipice of busing to integrate schools in Louisville, 98% of white parents opposed such a program. Flash forward, and today Louisville is one of the most integrated school districts in the country in which 89% of parents see diversity as desirable. Compare that to Detroit, a district with a very similar racial makeup and school segregation numbers in the 60s and 70s. The difference, the 1974 court case Milliken vs. Bradley, which halted busing to integrate students by race in Detroit. The Atlantic reports that Gary Orfield, co-founder of the Civil Rights Project, found that by 2000, the average black student in Detroit went to school with less than 2% of white students, while the average black student in Louisville went to a school that was half white. Furthermore, in 2011, 62% of Louisville fourth graders could do math at or above a fourth grade level. That percentage was just half that in Detroit. Is it too much to extrapolate the current financial situation of each city from this? Detroit's coming out of bankruptcy, while Louisville remains one of the lone economic bright spots on the Rust Belt. And, even in 2007, when the Supreme Court deemed Louisville's, read, uh, deemed Louisville's busing by race to integrate to be unconstitutional, the city wished to remain integrated. So they turned to Orfield, who designed a complex system of city clusters which essentially interdistricted the city. It was essentially voluntary redistricting, in which schools were 
then composed of a mix of minority students, students with parents of different educational attainments, and students who came from homes of different annual income. To recap, by some metrics, our schools are more segregated than they were 40 years ago. That's what the Civil Rights Project declared in a January 2009 report. We also know, as Rucker Johnson showed, that integration can, the impact of integration cannot be understated. Black students are more likely to graduate on time and go on to live healthier, more prosperous lives. White students see either no effect or a slight positive one. Due to court decisions, we're mostly unable to use race as a basis to bus to integrate students across districts. So we must look for other ways to get to those answers we know work. Though not always politically expedient, Louisville shows that redistricting or interdistricting a city can make integration more logistically feasible. Further, mandating busing to integrate districts based on socioeconomic class as opposed to race may assist in answering the same problem without troubling the court decisions. We just had a black president. That doesn't mean it's time to stop some very successful programs at mending the scars of centuries of poor race relations in this country. Rather, we must continue to strive to make America an even more perfect society. And in order to do so, we need all of our students to be well-educated. Thank you.